Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to the Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Andrew Womack, and today I want to talk to you about prayer, specifically talk to you about a better way to pray than what most of you are praying. And you know, the moment I say something like that, I know that there's immediately some resistance and people say, what makes you think the way I'm praying is wrong? You know, if I could do a survey, I've done this at my meetings, but if I could ask how many of you believe in prayer, nearly every hand goes up. And then I ask about how many of you have prayed and you see every single prayer answered. And boy, most hands go down. There's very few people that are seeing consistent answers to prayer. And yet that's what the Bible teaches. Like for instance, there's many places, but Matthew chapter 7 says, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Some people try and explain that away by saying, well, that's not for every person. The next verse, verse 8 says, Everyone that asks receives, and everyone that seeks finds, and everyone that knocks it shall be opened. The scriptures preach that we are supposed to see our prayers answered, and yet most people aren't being very effective. They pray for all kinds of things without an, a visible, knowledgeable answer to their prayer. And so I believe that there is a better way to pray. And I specifically entitled my teaching on this subject, A Better Way to Pray. Not you're up the devil if you don't pray this way, or you are all wrong, or God hates you if you don't pray this way. Because, you know, everything I teach against in this series, like I have a book on this as well as a CD set, and this book is entitled A Better Way to Pray. And everything I teach against in here, I have prayed that way. And God still loved me, and I loved God. But you know what? I am, I am getting better results now than I've ever gotten. And so the, re the point I'm trying to make is, I'm not saying that you're a bad person if you don't pray this way, but I am saying that very few people are getting good results in their prayer. And there is a better way to pray. There are things that the Word of God teaches us about prayer that would radically change your prayer life and change the results that you're getting. The very first thing I do in this series, in this book that I've got on prayer, is begin to start teaching against the wrong ways to pray. And I took this from Jesus because in the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew, Jesus taught on prayer. You go down to verse 9 is where uh, he gave what is traditionally called the Lord's Prayer. Actually, I don't think that this is the model that we are supposed to pray from because it doesn't pray in the name of Jesus, which Jesus made it very clear towards the end of his ministry in John chapter 16 that, you know, prior to that time they had never asked for anything in his name. But he says, now pray in his name and you ask in his name and the Father will do it for you. So in the New Testament, we're supposed to pray in the name of Jesus. This isn't prayed in the name of Jesus. This isn't, wasn't ever intended to be a prayer that was recited the way it's done by so many Christians today. Now, there may be some benefit to it, but that's missing the point. It's more like just a way of praying. It shows you that you enter into His gates with thanksgiving. Our Father which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. That's consistent with Psalms 100 where it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And then it ends with praise. And during, in the middle, you slip in your prayer request. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so it's, it's a model prayer. It's a way to pray, but it was never intended to be recited. Most people are familiar with those passages, but are you aware that right before Jesus said these things about our Father which art in heaven, he said this about prayer first in Matthew chapter 6. It says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets that they may be seen of man. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Jesus spent three verses here speaking against religious or hypocritical prayers. 
And look at this in the fifth verse. He says, And when you pray, be not as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray. Here is a startling statement that may just shock some of you down to your toenails. But hypocrites love to pray. Therefore, prayer in itself is not that val uh, valid or valuable. All of the other religions of the world pray. There are groups that bow down on mats and pray towards their certain place many times a day, and they... They are very devout, and yet all they do is go out and kill people in the name of God. They go out and they are contrary to everything that the true Word of God reveals, and they aren't in contact with God. And let me say that there are a lot of religious Christians who pray all of the time, but it's not connecting with God. Man, I, I know that I've probably upset a lot of people and that probably needs more explanation, but I've got a lot I want to say. I'm just going to leave it with what Jesus said. Jesus said hypocrites love to pray. Just prayer in itself is not any good unless you are connecting with God. If, you, if God isn't talking back to you, if all it is is a one-way communication, and if you spend hours a day talking and going through a rosary or praying our Father and doing all of these things, and you're doing everything, but it's all a one-way communication, and if God isn't speaking to you, if you don't have God's heart, if you don't feel God's pleasure, if you aren't making connecting with, connection with God, then all your prayer is is just a religious hypocrisy. Now, those are strong statements, and I probably got someone mad, but that's exactly what Jesus said. He said hypocrites love to pray, standing in the street corners and in the synagogues so that they can be seen of men. You know, when I hear people pray and they all of a sudden change their voice and it becomes old English, Our Father, we beseech you so humbly today that thou mightest, wouldest, couldest, please do this. And they start using old uh, King James English and they change their voice and it becomes this dramatic thing. I just write hypocrite over them. Now, I guess there may be some exceptions where a person has heard that so many times that they just think that's the way that they have to talk to communicate to God and maybe their heart is right. But in the vast majority of cases, that is just hypocrisy. I tell you what, God is not old English. Now, I use the King James Bible and I stick to it and I get criticized for doing that. But I don't pray King James. I don't prophesy King James. If I have to talk to God in King James and change my voice and change my personality, then it's not genuine. It's not real. It's hypocritical. You know what? God wants you to talk to him like he's a real person. And if we would quit all of this hypocrisy in prayer, all of the religious trappings, some people believe that you have to have your hands folded, you have to have your eyes closed, you have to be in a kneeling position. And certainly all of those things may be appropriate in certain places, but prayer is basically just communication with God. In Psalms chapter 5, it says, O Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. And if I was to go over there and study those verses, I could prove to you that even meditation, what you are thinking upon, is prayer to God. It's not all spoken. It can be the prayer in your heart. And Jesus prayed when he raised Lazarus from the dead and finally spoke out loud and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And yet there was no recorded prayer. Apparently he had prayed in his heart. He had already been in communion with God. Prayer is just communion. It's communication. You know, if a person came in to my study and wanted a counseling session, and if I just all of a sudden started and I spoke for one whole hour, and I just talked to them, and it was all a monologue. It was all what I said, but I never listened to them. I never let them have any input. There was no communication. It was just a monologue. Then you know what? That's not counseling. And likewise, prayer isn't prayer if you don't talk to God and let Him speak. You know, if you use the analogy of one of these um, CB uh, radios or a two-way radio, you know, every once in a while we need to say over 
and let God speak instead of us just speaking to Him. I had a pastor friend that we were very close and we prayed together and did a lot of things. And this man would often get up and say things. And he, I remember at one time he says, I was in the shower and God spoke to me and God told him something. And then he stopped and he says, I don't know why God talks to me in the shower and when I'm out running. He says, I pray hours a day and God never speaks to me when I'm praying. It's when I'm in the shower. It's when I'm out running that I get these revelations from God. And when he said that, I thought to myself, I know why God doesn't talk to you when you pray because this guy was kind of Pentecostal in his prayer life and when he prayed, it was just like a machine gun and he started and bam, 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 bam. And man, he just for an hour talked and never took a breath, never gave God an opportunity to say anything. God couldn't get a word in edgewise. And so he would do this monologue to God and if God wanted to talk to him, he had to catch him when he was out jogging or when he was you know, in the shower or someplace like that where he wasn't talking. Prayer needs to be communication. And this is what the Lord is saying. He says, look, there is a hypocritical way to pray. And hypocrites love to pray. Love to pray. They don't just pray out of duty. They love to do it. It strokes their ego. It makes them look important. I had a man come to my office one time and he asked me, he says, so how much do you pray every day? And you know, when he said that, I was kind of put off by it. And I thought, well, what business of that, uh, is, you know, is it to him? What, he doesn't uh, have any business knowing how much I pray. And I tried to figure out why he was asking this. And the only reason I can think of is so that he could either put me down or compare himself with me and make himself feel good but you know, as I was considering and trying to quantify how much I pray every day, the Lord just spoke to me about my wife. And the previous day, we had spent the whole day together. We drove someplace in Colorado and we weren't talking the entire time, but we spent the whole day together. We were with each other. We ate together. We drove together. We were together all day. And... Um, the Lord was saying, how much time did you spend with your wife yesterday? Well, I spent the whole day with her. We didn't, it wasn't formal us talking or having some discussion the whole time, but we were together all day and the Lord just spoke to me and he says, you know, if you could reduce the time that you communicate and commune with me down to 30 minutes or an hour in one day and yet I'm available 24 hours out of the day, then that's a sorry relationship. If I could say, well, I spend 30 minutes with my wife every day, and yet I'm with her all day long, but we only spend 30 minutes in communication, well, then that's not a good relationship. You know what? God is with you all of the time, and you ought to be able to spend all day in the presence of the Lord. You ought to be in communion with God constantly. You know, right now I'm making television programs. But I am listening to the Lord. God is speaking to me. God is reminding me of things that He's spoken to me, and I'm in communion with God. I have developed a way that I can keep my mind stayed on the Lord, and I'm constantly in communion, and God is speaking to me. That's what prayer is. In verse 6 of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, But when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. In other words, prayer is not supposed to be something that you do for a claim from other people. A person who says, how much do you pray? And they want to know so that they can compare themselves. They aren't praying because they really want to have a relationship and communion with God. They're praying so that they can have leverage to make themselves feel better about themselves or to make themselves look better than someone else. All of that's the wrong reason. In verse 7 it says, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Boy, this makes it very clear that length of time is not what makes prayer really good. Do you know some of the best prayers that you can pray are short prayers. Like, help is an awesome prayer, amen. That's a great prayer. You look at Jesus, and Jesus, when he prayed and saw great miracles happen, he just said, peace, be still, and boom, the storm stopped, the wind stopped, the waves stopped. He said, be healed. 
Actually, many times when we pray these long extended prayers, it's because you are trying to psych yourself up into believing. I think that short prayers actually take great faith. Man, Jesus is saying that you are not going to be heard based on how long you pray. The quality of prayer is much more important than the quantity of prayer. And he says, don't think, don't use vain repetitions the way the heathen do. You know, if you look at these groups that pray three and four times a day and go through these rituals and they have these loudspeakers that call everybody to prayer, if you go and listen to their prayer, they just chant a mantra. There is no communion. They are praying a dead prayer. And I know that people will misunderstand my motive. I'm not trying to hurt anybody, but I'm telling you, people that use a rosary and go through and say these canned prayers, people that use Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 12, where it talks about our Father, and they just pray this prayer, and they don't ever communicate what's in their heart, and they don't ever say over and listen to what God has to say to them. And they are just praying some formula that is not what, God, what pleases God. God wants relationship with you. And you can make this so structured that you don't have any true communion with God. You know, I, like I said when I told, started this, this is a better way to pray. Everything I'm praying against, I have done at one time. And when I first got really turned on to the Lord, I knew that I needed to spend more time focused on God and praying to God. And so I set a ritual that I set a clock, an alarm, and I forget now exactly what it was, but from 7 to 8 or 7 to 9 every day, I was going to pray for one or two hours. And I did this as a discipline, and I was just going to force myself to be in the presence of God and to pray and to focus on God. There was probably some benefit to that in the sense that at least I was trying to communicate with God. But did you know over a period of time, it got to where I dreaded that period of time. I remember the very first time, this was before I had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. And you know, when you don't speak in tongues, you can pray for the whole world in 30 minutes. I mean, it's hard to pray an hour. And the very first time I ever made a decision that I was going to pray for a one solid hour, and I set the alarm. I mean, I was praying, and after five minutes, I looked thinking, surely it's 30 minutes. And it had only been five minutes. And it seemed like that hour drug on. And I did this for months. And I just forced myself to go in. And I mean, I, I, I just didn't know how to pray. It was, it was not connecting with God. It was just a monologue. It was me talking, but I'm not sure that uh, I was listening to God, and it became, it became ritualistic. It became dead. And anyway, one time, it was getting close to 7 o'clock, and I just spoke to the Lord, and I said, God, I hate to admit this, but I said, you know my heart anyway. I said, I dread this prayer time. I said, I'll be studying the Bible and praying and communing with God, and I'll be enjoying the presence of God, and God will be speaking to me, but then comes 7 o'clock, and I have to stop studying the Bible, and I have to quit praying about whatever I was thinking about, and I've got to go into this time of intercession and prayer. And I said, just to be honest, I dread it. I hate it. I enjoy my relationship with you greatly, but not during this prayer time. And I said, I'm sorry. I hate to say it, but I just dread this prayer time from 7 till 8 o'clock. I start dreading it at 6.45. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, Andrew, don't feel bad. I start dreading it at 6 o'clock. <laughs> and when the Lord spoke that to me, I just thought, well, man, if God dreads it, if God isn't enjoying this, and I'm not enjoying it, why am I doing it? And I realized... It was just a religious calisthenic that I was doing, something to make me feel good and feel holy. And I quit my formalized prayer. You know, let me make a comparison here. You know, prayer is just communion. It's communication. Now, I believe that families are supposed to spend time together. And it's so easy to get separated with the kids going to soccer practice and football practice and baseball, basketball, all of this stuff. And everybody's going in different directions. And I believe that it's great to have a family time. 
But did you know if you just make it so structured that you say, all right, from 7 o'clock until 9 o'clock every night, nobody's talking on the phone, nobody's doing any homework, nobody's going to watch TV, nobody's going to play any game, nobody's going to do anything, it's a time to fellowship. And so if you establish it, there could be some good to that, but it depends on how you do it. Let's just say that everybody, you know, one's talking on the phone. The other one is playing a game. Somebody is reading a book. Somebody's doing something. Everybody's involved. And then all of a sudden, it's like, all right, three, two, one, fellowship. And you have to stop everything that you're doing and just boom, here you've got to be a family and you've got to be fellowshipping. You know, it's not going to work that way. You can't just force it. Relationships don't work that way. And here is, here's a radical thought. Prayer is just having relationship with God. It's just fellowship with God. It's communion with God. And it needs to be more spontaneous than what most people have made it. You know, I've got a lot of teaching on this, but I, I could just continue to expound on that. Let me also say uh, this point before I quit today, that there is a huge difference. I mean huge difference between the way you pray in the Old Covenant and the way you pray in the New Testament. For instance, look at this, what David prayed in Psalms chapter 51. This is after his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband was brought out into the open. And he said this in Psalms 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Did you know that that prayer is still prayed by people today? There are songs written about this, about creating me a clean heart, O God. It was appropriate for David to pray this because he wasn't a born-again man. But under the new covenant, if you are born again, it's wrong for you to ask God to create in you a clean heart because that's what happened to you when you got born again. And you don't lose that clean heart. Your body and your mind may be defiled, but your spirit retains its relationship with God. And for you to pray this prayer is a lack of understanding of what you, has really happened to you, and you aren't going to have a good relationship with God if you pray that. Also notice he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. In the New Covenant, he promised, I would never leave you nor forsake you. And we pray so many prayers that are just completely contrary to the Word of God. People will come into a church service and say, oh God, just be with us as we meet today. When he says, I'll never leave you. Where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. People will say things like, well, your prayer didn't get above the ceiling. You don't need your prayer to get above your nose. God's here on the inside. That's the reason we bow our heads when we pray, so we can look at God. This whole concept that we hear so much in spiritual warfare conferences about you got to get your prayers past the demonic opposition and create a hole in the heavens so our prayers can get up to God is completely wrong. There is a difference between the way people prayed in the Old Testament and the way people prayed in the New Testament.